Kalinic on the bassoon etudes. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the bassoon um, professor. Yes. I, I was like, I don't know what to call you. You're a professor um, from Sam Houston State University. He will be your clinician today talking about your bassoon etudes. Uh, this is Nathan Cook. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to doing this every year. And like she said, I'm Dr. Nathan Cook. I am the assistant professor of bassoon at San Houston State University. And we are located in Huntsville, Texas, uh, which is uh, about an hour north of the Houston area, uh, nestled up there with, with our uh, state prison and all of that fun stuff. But uh, we're rapidly expanding school, very strong music program, well over 400 students in our program now, bachelor's, master's degrees, that sort of thing. I also teach um, one of the aural skills, uh, which we call musicianship courses, and kind of help coordinate that area with some other uh, of our faculty. Um, in addition, I get to perform in the Houston area, like we did the Grand Opera recently in the ballet and the Houston Latin American Philharmonic, which is a cool group if you ever get to hear that. Um, I enjoy long walks on the beach and sunsets and all that. So, yeah. All right, so uh, digging right in, I would like to start off a, just a little bit out of order. I would like to start with etude number 30, which is on page two of your staple handout. <laughs> Yes, both of these come from the volume two, uh, at least my, my edition is this orange peach color here. So we'll start with number 30. And it is up here on the screen. I'd like to just give a, a brief little performance here first, and then talk about a few things with this. <clears throat> Just on the smoothness of the fingers without having to worry about laying them up. 
enough at first. And then as soon as the fingers are doing what you want and your air is doing what you want, then you can add in the articulation. Okay? Now, uh, the second bullet point under there, shifted beat with a metronome, is one of my all-time favorites. All-time, all-time favorite exercises for practicing, and my students will tell you this as well. So shifting the beat with the, uh, with the metronome means that you are going to put the tick of the metronome, uh, assuming, and I have my metronome set on 66, which is quarter equals 132, a little math this morning, um, is putting the tick on notes other, in every group of four, notes other than the first note in every group of four. What we get really good at many times is aiming for that tick on the first note in every group of four. What happens in between those often is a little uh, a bit of rushing or dragging, but our, t our downbeats are, are right on the tick. And sometimes it's hard to hear that, but instead, so that's on the second note. And if you can do the printed articulation, just shift everything over. It really messes with your brain and, and gets you out of any ruts that you've been in. On the third note. So it really highlights any, um, any pathways that, uh, that you've created already. Uh, and then lastly, as far as metronome work for evenness and making sure your tempo is right with, uh, where you want it to be, um, I am a big proponent of, um, especially in the faster pieces, taking away as many of the subdivisions as you can. Go for one tick per measure. So if quarter equals 132, half note equals 66, whole note would equal Sorry? 33? 33, yeah. So let's see what that sounds like. And if you can aim for the downbeat with just one tick per measure, and in, in the entire measure, keep up your tempo. <laughs> per beat. And again, because of the tempo, and I do like to take it faster, this is not an etude that should be felt in four. It is entirely the wrong feeling. So, all right, uh, moving on to the top of page three. Uh, when you're uh, working on uh, phrasing ideas with this, look for and encourage your students to look for the compositional techniques that are being in, uh, used in this etude. Um, look for sequences, modulations, repeated material, all the stuff that you would look for in actual solo literature. Try to get inside the head of our lovely composer, Julius Weissenborn, who was, by the way, a romantic composer and bassoonist, principal bassoonist of the Gewandhaus Orchestra in Leipzig when he was in his early 20s. He was a very talented, precocious individual. Uh, so try to get inside his head in terms of composition uh, and um, if you can highlight some of the techniques that, that he was using, it really shows a deeper understanding of this and it's not just a technical exercise. Uh, like I was saying, aim for those multi-measure ideas um, uh, whenever possible, but uh, as is printed on a lot of these, these little swells in the middle of the measure, go for multi-measure, but don't forget about those little swells in the, the grand scheme of things. And like I said, feel this etude in one, maybe two, never in four. In terms of articulation, um, we have two main types. We have marcato, which are the, the, the fatter, uh, almost little arrows, carrots down there, the marcato accents on the downbeats. And we have staccato. Marcato, fuller, longer, heavier, slightly harsher on the front of the note. T more t. The, the staccatos, lighter, fluffier, and still separate. So marcato, and then the staccatos will be just a little softer and separated. So, oh gosh. To isolate that, uh, break them down into the different components as I've outlined there on, on 
on page three. suggestion. I like a general two bar crescendo, two bar decrescendo, all the while keeping those little swells in between. Okay, so little picture, but don't forget about big picture as well. Moving on, uh, definitely pay attention to the clarity at the starts of your notes. Bassoons, double reads in general, if some things are not perfectly exact in terms of embouchure or some fingering thing, our notes can crack and squawk. <laughs> starts of our notes, growl, and then it sounds like we're, we're making a mistake. So, especially in this A2, we have a lot of the half hole notes. So, G3, A flat 3, and then flicked notes. A3, B flat 3, B3, C4. So, top of the bass clef staff are real issues with, with bassoon uh, players specifically. So, the, for the flicking, make sure you're just lining up your, your thumb and your tongue. Uh, for the half hole notes, experiment. So the half hole has to do with your index finger. Make sure you are using near the tip in front of the, the soft fleshy pad on your index finger. Make sure you're using in front of that towards the tip. And make sure that you are uncovering in the direction, opposite direction that this hole is drilled into the instrument. If you look at it, it is drilled up and at an angle that way. But if you uncover down this way, you are changing the shape of the tone hole a little bit. So uncover down and to the back, and you will maintain that shape because the hole is also oblong, or it's oval, not perfectly round. So down, back, and to the left with the tip of your finger, your finger. You have more control that way, and that will help with the clarity. In general, G's slightly bigger half hole, A flat's right above that slightly smaller half hole. It's minute but it, it can uh, help a lot with the clarity. Um, going on, uh, make sure uh, with these larger leaps, if we're looking measure five through eight, um, can I point that here? No. Uh, measure five through eight, uh, and also 17 through 22, so all this stuff. <laughs> notes that drop down, make sure embouchure is loose, throat is open, and practice all of these slow legato for intonation. So make sure everything opens up as you go down into the staff, otherwise those notes tend to be bright and sharp. Uh, also, I like varying the rhythm. suggestions for this one. I tend to use for the F sharp half hole, I tend to use the pinky fingering, which is outlined right there, instead of a thumb fingering. This fingering is darker and a little bit lower in pitch, and in, I use this about 99% of the time. For the A flat right above that, if you have a student that is feeling a little ambitious, you can kind of change it up. So uh, at the beginning, all of these alternating figures is pinky related, right? Pinky related. What you can do if they want something with a little more opposing fo uh, forces, we can switch up the fingering for the A flat from a pinky to a thumb and using that back there. So instead of instead of an active pinky, which is very doable, uh, and that's, that's what I do, you can also do thumb so they use their pinky once. And for some of them, that will also help with evenness. If they cannot get their pinky to be really even, because again, it's one of our weaker fingers, sometimes subbing in 
it's a little more tactile, it makes a little more tactile sense for them in terms of eatiness. So see what works for them. Uh, and then lastly, if their tenor E flat is just absolutely nowhere near in pitch, you might experiment with that fingering, which is just uh, a, a, a little bit higher in pitch than the full fingering in the right hand. But uh, the other one should be, should be doable, definitely. Okay, any questions over that etude? No? It offers a lot of opportunity for, uh, for interpretation, so yes ma'am. And so you read right after the downbeat of 13. I did. Um, that's, that's another reason I take this faster. <laughs> because theoretically, at, at faster tempos, you can make it all the way to 24 in one breath. So if you have to breathe, I like breathing in measure 13 because it's where the material comes back. But I've also experimented with breathing after the downbeat of measure 17. You know, which is the start of a new character in my interpretation of this. So, you know. The E flat above the staff? Yes. One, two, and two, three. Two, three. Listen, so the normal fingering for the right hand is one, two, three. sense sharper in pitch. It's not as full, uh, but for some students, if they just need a little bit, does it respond better about the same? Uh, it usually responds a little bit better. Technically, that is a slur fingering that pops out a lot easier. Any other questions? No? Okay. I'd like to move on to AT number 21 then. Let me get a tempo for this one. Gosh, 30 minutes is never enough time. Okay. Okay. So etude number 21. Oh, Seventy-six is, is my recommendation for this. It is doable. Um, uh, with with um, this one, and specifically uh, because there are some rhythmic things, what I would start doing, and since you, your students have so much time with these lovely pieces, to help keep them fresh, don't even try them on the instrument at, at first. So, yeah. Um, uh, I make my students tap and sing a lot. So can we look at uh, just the, the first... Uh, phrase up until the second beat of measure four, and I want you to tap on your leg. It's about seven six. Yeah. Ah, and we're gonna sing on da. Don't care about pitch. Just go generally up and down, we're focusing on the rhythm. Ready? And da 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 Good. 
So getting that, having that tactile response, or that, that uh, tactile um, aspect of the beat, like they actually feel it physically being beaten into them, they, they uh, get a, a real sense of the pulse. And then while they're singing, they don't have to focus on the, the mechanical aspects. Then we can focus on the bare bones uh, melody, uh, adding some phrasing ideas all away from the instruments so that it's really developing their inner voice. I mean, after all our instruments, so many of them are meant to mimic singing anyway. So developing your inner voice, that inner concept of what you want to uh, produce with your instrument is really, really important. So uh, if you look at um, uh, what I outlined there on, on the first page, that is what I would uh, classify as the bare bones melody contained in this piece of music. I've taken out anything faster than the eighth note, or faster than quarter notes. I have removed the ornaments, and I have added, um, made everything really, really long notes, and added some dynamics and phrasing ideas. So, can we tap and sing from, from the handout, the bare bones melody, uh, keeping in mind all the, the crescendos and crescendos. So tap and sing, ready, and go. Da, da, da. structure on top of which we add the more technical aspects. Okay, so having them sing that, having them play that bare bones, gives them something to, to then ornament in a way when they add all of these extra rhythms and stuff, where it's more complicated. Now, you'll also see some numbers on there. Every once in a while I run into students where the dynamics, like, you know, well, they just don't resonate with them, the different levels. And so uh, the number system tends to work with them as well. Um, and this was popularized by a really famous oboe professor, um, Tabuto, uh, uh, who basically um, used numbers in place of dynamics to help visualize levels, dynamic levels that wish to perform. So throw some numbers in there, uh, just like I did. So peaks of phrases are bigger numbers, and that, that also gives you, um, you know, uh, ways to keep things uh, relative. Okay, gosh, I need to... Uh, in terms of ornaments, real quick. Bottom of page one, um, I played option two. Option one is printed in the book. For measure three, I did a quintuplet. I think it sounds interesting. I think it sounds cool, um, but both would be correct. In measure seven, depending on your tempos, I had to, I would prefer option two, just because I, I, I'm more than, was usually more than one wiggle um, it, it, as far as my instruction went, but I had to choose option one because of the fast tempo, so I only had time for one wiggle in there for that mordant. Uh, measure eight, I did option two. Uh, I preferred that one because it emphasizes the written pitch, the dotted eighth notes. Da, 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 da. And, and uh, is, is hearkening back to actually the printed rhythm without the ornaments. When you do the first note, the actual printed dotted eighth note, is a little bit in the background. And some people prefer that. So I would do that one. Fingering suggestions for this one. Uh, I'd like to highlight the C sharp specifically, the full fingering in the middle there. Normally, a, a short fingering sounds like this. Full. It's just a little more in character with the notes around it, uh, and it also projects better. So in general, I use that one. Um, also, with, uh, with this one, I uh, have made available on my website, which is the URL is at the bottom of the page there. Can, are you able to see that in there? I'm sorry, I didn't make it on your handout. Uh, but that is my personal page. I made available a piano accompaniment to, uh, to go along with 21 at 70, quarter equals 76, 78, 80, and 82. So the, the range that, that it's, um, uh, it gives you there. So it sounds a little like this. You get four ticks. <laughs> with the rhythms, the 
dotted rhythms, all of these ornaments. It's helpful to have something plodding along, you know, and, and to, to give the student something to latch onto. But as with um, any unaccompanied work, it's never truly unaccompanied. There's always an underlying harmony. The Bach cello suites, all of that stuff has a, a background harmony. This kind of realizes what could go along with this and often gives the students a, a, a different way to listen to it. So I've made that available for free on my website. The URL is there again. Um, I have also made available, you should have your second handout, that is the piano accompaniment. That was actually being performed by Sibelius Sounds. Um, and that, if uh, you want to spread that around, that PDF is also on the website along with the handout, the stapled handout that you received today. Um, so I think that's about it. Do you have any uh, other questions for this etude or anything in general? No? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming today. Hope to see you again next year. Thank you.